everybody and welcome back to the P1 Max Verstappen podcast with Matt and Tommy. Today we are, of course, reviewing the first race of the season. We are back, Formula One in 2024, and what a delightful nail-biting fight it was between Yuki Tsunoda and Daniel Ricciardo for P13 and P14 on the cool-down lap. Am I right, Tom Bellingham? What a race, 10 out of 10. Yeah, Formula One is back, and it's like it's never been away for many reasons uh, why it feels like 2023, the sequel. Um, but we'll get does. into it. We certainly will. Before we do, uh, want to quickly do a shout out for our P1 live show tickets. If you haven't got them already, we're doing Cambridge, Bath and London, middle of April. Come and join us. Meet like-minded Formula One fans. People have come on their own. People have come in groups. It is a such a wonderful experience. We'd love to see you there. Uh, link will be in the description and all over our socials. OK, let's start with our most memorable moment and my most memorable moment. When it ended. <laughs> <laughs> wow um when what ended the season the race i don't know the race like it actually at the beginning not with max necessarily but from p2 down to p5 it looked promising it looked like we might get a serious battle uh between perez signs leclerc and russell we had to almost start, almost immediately start imagining that Max Verstappen didn't exist in Formula One, and that was the battle for the lead. And it and it seemed like it could, you know, that could be the thing that gives us entertainment throughout the race. But that didn't really come to fruition either, and it was just it was it was a quite a mediocre race. Let's be let's be real here. Um, there were small moments, but not a lot. And Bahrain is a great track, in my opinion. And I felt like it didn't deliver anywhere near to the level that we've come to expect from it. You've said before, Tommy, that it's quite an underrated track in, in a lot of people's books. And um, I, I completely agree. I think it's right up there as a track that should promote lots of overtaking. Um, but we, we didn't really didn't really see it. So it was it was quite a slow ending to the race as well. The only thing that we were invested in was Magnus and Ricardo and Sonoda because of Sonoda's team radio. That's the only thing we were kind of <laughs> locked in with for the last few laps. And then obviously that big battle between Ocon and Gasly for 17th when Gasly had gone in the pits for fresh softs. What, what controversy and drama. You do wonder how Formula One are going to spin it with these graphics that have things like the fight for 17th. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, it was a it was a flat start to the season, sadly. Um, obviously, you know, to cover the elephant in the room. I'm sat here wearing a Max Verstappen t shirt, and Max is my favourite driver. But, and I've said this so many times, I don't think it's a surprise that he won. It certainly wasn't. Uh, but it's a shame that not a lot of other stuff happened. I think um, we've seen so much dominance in the past, and I know a lot of people will be sort of doom and gloom that it looks like uh max is a long way ahead uh to say the least but i think the problem for me is that race really didn't deliver in other aspects normally we're here sort of beating that drum of going look well there's the so much other stuff in formula me. one to yeah. look at look at the midfield look at the battle for second and apart from the uh ferrari battle for a bit yeah there was there's quite a lot of moments in the race you don't need every grand prix grand prix to be like this absolute wall-to-wall -wall entertainment battle but yeah a lot of times you just looked at the order nothing would happen for 10 laps before you'd seen an overtake and you look at the gaps and everyone no one's within drs and then even when they do get within drs i mean yeah what where's this overtaking oh my god the new cars are going to be so easy to overtake and then you watch daniel ricardo on soft tires can't get past a house at bahrain which is meant to be an easy track to overtake with drs yeah Sorry, drs but... uh enabled on lap one did a lot as well didn't it <laughs> that, that if anything uh just created yeah. a, a drs train in the midfield which didn't actually promote all too much um chaos either uh, and Verstappen was clear by a second 
um, pretty much by the end of lap one. Um, so there was much <laughs> to really uh, rave about with that either. A uh, question from P1 Patreon member James BWFC22. Is there any chance they can bring the 2026 regulation changes forward to 2025? Obviously a joke from James. Um, that's not going to happen because teams have to prepare for said regulation changes. But what I will be aware of and what Formula One and Liberty Media are going to be aware of is the exact picture that is being painted before them with with the sport and its current state. They hit, in 2021, through Drive to Survive in the early years of that, some amazing peaks for the sport. The interest through the roof. But the thing is now, it's dropping. The interest is, of course, going to start to wane and start to, to dip because people don't like domination. A lot of sports... There are There is some level of unpredictability for the win. But for some reason, Formula One cannot have two teams create a similarly paced car at the front of the field. Hardly at all. Obviously, 2021 was a pipe dream. But apart from that, maybe the start of 22. But every other year, it just seems like a team get it right. <laughs> and then one driver is so clear of the other one. And that's what Formula One is. Um, so I think that, yes... There isn't much we can do between now and 2026. I thought Red Bull might take it a little bit easy this year so that they don't do anything drastic for 25. But no, Max was like, <laughs> I want to drive fast and I will. At least in 2025, we have, uh, you know, looks like we're going to get, well, we are going to get one huge change. And I think that will have that kickstart effect on, on everything else. I think we've gone into this new season as well. The pecking order is... Very, very similar, uh, to say the least. No driver changes. So, so there's not even that narrative of, you know, like the first race of the next season, you'll have all these driver changes and things. And I think, yeah, the problem is uh, the first race was just a bit of a flat feeling because there was so much excitement for Formula 1 to be back. There always is. Um, we complain about, oh, it's not going to be this, uh, this or that. But we all sit down and watch it. And uh, yeah, it just it just sadly didn't deliver. And uh, for me, the most disappointing thing is uh, just the raceability of the cars. They just don't seem to have that anymore. And uh, they're in a bit of a pickle. And I don't, just don't think it is just because of Max Verstappen. Obviously, that is a huge factor because we had that race for the lead. And you always want to see race races for the lead. But you look at the order and it's like two Ferraris. You know, say a Hamilton didn't have the issues, it probably would have been two Mercs, two McLarens, two Aston Martins, no yeah, retirements. They would have literally been two by two. Yeah, two by two, to no retirements, no one within DRS, people unable to pass. And I think the problem, the pro it's not even just the problem that uh, 2021 baited us into um, this this season. 2022 started off really exciting and and they also this was like liberty's th these regulations is like liberty media's and formula one's new master plan to make really close field um easy to overtake um you know budget cap so everyone's really close and and stuff like that and it's not working it's really not working I guess this kind of leads us quite nicely into the next question, which is from QB Coach Mika. How does F1 fix their issues of it being a snooze fest? I mean, Formula One have been trying to fix issues of dominance for forever, basically, because they allow for it to be an open-ish sport in terms of creativity. And of course, you know, there's technical regulations, there's things they have to abide by, but you, you, you allow teams to try and come up with the fastest car possible this is unfortunately what you will get from a just a, you know just a basic understanding of formula 1 that is unfortunately what you will get you look at oh could, it could be a spec series but then that loses what formula 1 is all about you have the cost cap which in some ways works but in other ways works completely against um trying to get a battle at the top of the field because if you don't have a regulation change for four, three, four years and Red Bull get it so, so right and everybody else gets it so, so wrong, 
they can't spend any more money than Red Bull because there's a cap, which means that everybody is limited to a certain <laughs> level of development and trying different parts and all that sort of stuff. So maybe, I don't know. Twix. Just to counter that, though, that I have been thinking about that, 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 that narrative of, oh, well, because of the budget cap, no one can catch Red Bull. But the fact that Red Bull have completely changed their car, they've not even just made it better or kept it the same and everyone, no one can catch up because they can't spend money. They've made a completely different car. And, I'm, and we all know how good Red Bull and their design team and Adrian Newey is. But it does. it is frustrating because like, surely if they can completely change the con- concept of their entire car and still be dominant, if not even more dominant, why can none of the other teams do that? I, I'm not expecting Haas or whatever to do it, but Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, they have big budgets. They're at the top of the, this budget cap as well. And it's, it is such a shame because uh, we know how good it, it can be, and we've seen it before. Even 2013, Sebastian Vettel and Red Bull were dominating. But you had races where Ferrari... McLaren, Mercedes, Red Bull, they were all winning and, and it was like it was close in, in that regard, but yeah, it's not it's not now. It's annoying. It's very annoying. And this is me as a Max Verstappen fan. I'm a Formula One fan first. I want to see yeah. close, exciting racing. I supported Max because he was an exciting driver that made daring overtakes and, and things like that. So when he's 25 seconds of the lead, I don't get to see it. And I know that's like smallest file in the world that he's winning all the races. And you're like, oh, I must be already sorry for you. But I want to see I want to see good racing. I want to see good racing. You're here to watch entertainment. You're here to watch competition. And the only people that Verstappen are passing are Logan Sargent, Bottas, Gasly, Ocon, Hockenberg, and so on. And and that's to to lap them. Um, It is interesting, the whole budget thing. Now, whether there is a... A world where the the winning team spends let can only spend a certain amount <laughs> the next like year, an and then it kind of goes up. Thing. That like you know Williams and Alpine or whoever else would finish at the bottom this year can spend a lot more to develop their car. I don't know because obviously maybe they do have that in the sense of maybe big big brain Master thinking. <laughs> they want that wind tunnel time because they do it for the wind tunnel, but they don't do it for the amount of money you can spend. I'm sure there are reasons behind that, but it's uh yeah. At, at the, in the same breath, you have to commend Red Bull for what they've done. And it's clearly worked so, so well for them in this current era of regulations. And as you say, Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, Aston Martin, they've all got these insane facilities to build a Formula One car. And they cannot do it. They can't catch them. It's as simple as that. And, th- and this is in an era, this is what blows my mind the most, that... If from 2010, so what is that? Like 15 seasons of Formula One, only two teams have won the championship. It's just flipped between dominance between the two of them, right? And thanks for reminding me. <laughs> sorry, Ferrari fan, and and you, Matt. But what what is frustrating is these regulations. You go back to, I don't know, like the mid 2000s or whatever i'm sure the rule book was nowhere near as complex they weren't doing all these things to um try and make it closer or 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 you know like like the promise of these new regulations was that it gets them closer closer racing uh, and people can't be miles ahead and spend more yet we we're, we're in the period of the most dominant like time in the sport ever so like what are these regulations that 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 can happen when the rule book was a lot more simple or what or whatever you got you did get different winners and, and and things it's very bizarre that 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 is actually happening when they're trying so hard to make it close that it's not like how, how does that happen do you know what I mean? They're trying and it's doing the opposite effect. Maybe they just stop trying, rip up the whole rule book, make just what say, you want, make a car, <laughs> and we get a ten-team fight for the championship. Come on, right, Tommy? What's your most memorable moment? We could go on for uh, three hours about how Formula One is is finished. Uh, let's let's move on to something else. <laughs> Please keep watching P1. Uh, my most memorable moment was the drive from Carlos Sainz. Um, he deservedly got driver of the day. 
uh, and the very little racing that we got, uh, he also provided quite a lot of it. Uh, I think his his move on Leclerc, sorry, Matt, was very, very good indeed. Uh, you know, a surprise move. Um, and yeah, it was it was a it was a surprising uh, a surprising drive after after yesterday did not. You know, did not see that coming that that science would be flying through the field and and Leclerc uh, having those those issues. So yeah, it was a really really good drive from science. It certainly was. Um, apparently, if I say anything nice about anyone other than Charles Leclerc, I am a, a Charles Leclerc hater. Uh, even though Carlos Sainz's drive was brilliant and he did get driver of the day, um, as you say, his moves were great. Of course, Charles Leclerc was a, a slightly hindered by his brake problems, which probably then meant that Carlos could send the move um, a bit easier on his teammate. Um, but that being said, Carlos still you know, dispatched of George Russell. His pace was great. He was only a couple of seconds off Sergio Perez, which I think, again, is is a really good effort, considering that Ferrari looking quite fragile, quite tentative at times. Um, so, yeah, I thought it was I thought it was a great drive. Uh, question from George Jensen, 97. Why are Ferrari so afraid of team orders? Signs was clearly faster, but still had to fight his way through twice. Sorry, Matt, in brackets. <laughs> Uh, you don't have to apologise. I have fully processed the fact that Charles Leclerc's had problems with his car in race one of 2024. Uh, I can understand Ferrari not kind of bringing in uh, team orders immediately, mainly because Charles Leclerc, well, was their golden golden boy. I'm not sure about 2025. We'll have to have discuss that one another time. Um, Sainz is leaving the team. Do they want to ruffle Leclerc's feathers almost immediately? Probably not. So that's why they decided not to do it. Again, they are also afraid of team orders just generally. So that's another factor. And um, and look, we, we like the, the, the side-by-side action. It's very close. But every time <laughs> they do get close, that's as close as they get. And it is brilliant to watch, especially when I know they haven't crashed. So kind of watching the clips back are when I can fully appreciate that. Um, but yeah, maybe Ferrari also have an element of trust between them. Uh, but yes, there is still a little bit of time lost with those two fighting, but realistically, it might have cost signs an opportunity to fight Perez, potentially. He was only finishing a couple of seconds behind him in the end. Um, but yeah, I'm sure they didn't pr- really want to implement team orders immediately into the start of the season. No, I can see why they, they did it. I mean, this is it's what Ferrari are like now, which is a strange thing to say having grown up in the era of Michael Schumacher and then being that brutal uh, team or, or even, you know, a more recent history of like Fernando Alonso. And I remember one year where they literally broke Felipe Massa's gearbox on the purpose to give him a five second penalty. So Alonso could get the clean side of the grid. That is the extent that this team used to go to for, for a number one driver. And now they do seem like they're more willing to uh, let them race, uh, I will say, thank God they do, because it was some of the only action we saw in the entire race. Uh, but boy, was it good when it did happen, because uh, those two, I was, I'd have, I'd have put money on them, of had it having a collision by now. I think when they, it was announced that those two were going to be together in Ferrari, and you saw a, a bit of it in the first season they were together, and I think we said so many times like they will crash at some point and so by some miracle they haven't because when they race wheel to wheel they get so close they they did it again not as extreme as monza but they don't they they somehow don't give each other an inch but it is respectful they give each they other an inch them. at the very last second that is humanly possible to yeah, give an they inch they give each other like... a quarter of an inch <laughs> <laughs> Are we trying to think of like a centimeter or a millimeter? Or... Yeah, um, <laughs> a quarter of an inch is very inch. specific. <laughs> yeah, uh, just just smaller than an inch. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's, it's superb to watch. But uh, yeah, we, I hope there's more of it because uh, probably not for Ferrari fans because it gets the heart racing. But uh, we need to see but more. But it was of it probably it's good. the best bit of entertainment that we had uh, throughout the entire race. So, yeah. um, and you can just see really... that already. Like, you do wonder, science. Um, I know, I know, it fits the narrative, but and he will just want to do well, whatever. But you do wonder how much it is fired up by the fact that 
now he doesn't have a drive um and what i will say is like i don't there'll, there'll be all the tweets baiting you of course being like have they fired the wrong driver and all this kind of stuff which like no i don't think that's the case but what it has done is shown that like mercedes and red bull and these teams like need to look at carlos science because it would be a huge waste for him to go to <laughs> kick Sauber and be battling for 12th. Please no. Certainly would. Um, we'll have to see how that one, that one uh, uh, unfolds. Next question from Abraham Joe 33. How is this signs Leclerc dynamic going to play out? I think it's going to play out with eventual collision. That's how I see it uh, occurring, uh, especially you know, Ferrari is scared to do team orders anyway. Are they going to get on the phone to Carlos Sainz, who does not have a contract with them next year, to get out of the way for Charles Leclerc if that happens? I don't know. I don't know if they'd even want to face that reality of then realising what Carlos would say, which is probably, no, you can absolutely F off. I am not driving for <laughs> your, uh, your team next year. Um, so I, I don't know. I think they get on re really well. They seem they're great will-to-will -will racers, both of them. It's evident of that. Um, so I, I don't think it's going to change that much their their dynamic uh, unless they have a crazy crash for the lead of a, of a Grand Prix. Then they they may well despise each other forever. But that's just <laughs> Formula One, isn't it? No, I think they are very good friends. I think Carlos even said it in that that podcast we did with him that one day when they're not you know teammates, their relationship might even be even better. That that they're like really good friends, and they're. I think he said that he's probably one of the closest. Uh, drivers that he is to outside of you know uh, with Norris as well so yeah they get on really well and I don't think in, unless something disastrous happens it will ch it will change over the radio it's always very different um, and even if they do have those moments where you know science saying you know jog on or whatever or or what um, they'll they'll just get over it I think I don't think it's gonna uh, boil over at Ferrari. It'll stand the test of time. Next yes. question. Slosh 4000. How do you think the season will evolve for RB with Yuki and Danny? These two, eh? These two. Didn't expect... Did you actually see that Danny Rick said that Yuki was an effing helmet? <laughs> no. Yep. Wow. Um, so that's that's interesting. I didn't expect these two to kind of clash. They yeah, what if, if you'd have said any teammate dynamic, yeah. who would be the biggest fight between, like the yeah, the that would boil over the most? I'm they, they might even be last on my list. You know, mm. yeah, you just think that they would just even if there was a problem. Not say anything. I don't know. It just it seems very strange. And for it to boil over so early in round one is is a strange thing in itself. You know, what's going on behind the scenes there that's that's causing this tension? Was it the fact that both of these drivers expected this year with the hype that RB would be a lot better and perhaps just from a racing instinct side of things, they're a little bit frustrated? I don't know. But I am fascinated <clears throat> to see if this is, you know, if, is this a one-off? Or do they genuinely not really like each other? Or I don't know. It just I think I think so it's more strange. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's all from if you missed it, Yuki Sonoda's what happened at the end of the race, where uh, because we didn't see this on the broadcast, but Sonoda essentially dive bombed uh, Danny Rick on the cool down lap, and then sort of almost drove into him, uh, or sort of got like really close to his car and drove past to make a point. And what I would say is, as a Yuki Tsunoda fan, I was watching that race and I was I was annoyed. Uh, it happened so many times. It happened so many times at Alpha Tauri where I'm like, Yuki's having a really good race. What is going on with strategy and all this kind of stuff? And then he just, he just plummets down because he was on for P10, P11. He was fighting, yeah, he was fighting P10 with, uh, with Joe, wasn't it, at the time? Yeah, or? and he was, you know, Stroll. ahead of Stroll. I don't think he would have got would have got Stroll because Stroll was uh, coming back through the field. But P11 was definitely on the cards and you do want to beat your teammate because that's what you're up against. So it was frustrating for him that he had a slow stop and then he got a different strategy to 
Ricardo, so he could have Ricardo could have the softer tires. Danny Rick wasn't on his level, it seemed, all weekend. So I can understand his frustration that he's now finished behind him and had to let him through. But there's no excuse for like what has he got to gain for that? It's just hot headedness and just however annoying it is he's just putting himself in an awkward position with his team like he's not going to get he's not going to get the better treatment or or whatever if he's doing that is he he's just going to make it worse if anything they're going to exactly. fall out with him and they're going to be annoyed at him uh, you don't want to start a civil war in your own team like it's just it's just ridiculous Especially when you think, where is he going to go next? Needs to put himself in the sort of driver market potentially, and you know, what yeah, he's is a really quick you driver. You're just going to teams won't want to take the gamble on him if he's yeah. doing stuff like that. Especially, you know, does he want to race for Red Bull? That that second seat is not absolutely categorically signed off for Perez or for anyone. Um, so it is it is strange because teams want someone that they can rely on and for it to be a consistent figure, not someone that can occasionally blow off the go off the boil that's the one well if if, well let put it put it this way if Sonoda is doing that over p13 in the Bahrain Grand Prix if you're Helmut Marco you're going well say Yuki has the race of his life and he's leading and Max is quicker and needs to win the race for the championship but this is like hypothetical Mm -hmm. and Yuki Sonoda is acting like that over p14 he's he's gonna like lose his mind over like having to let Max win a race or whatever or or have team orders and they can't afford to have that in a team like that will affect you as teams like looking to to hire you because they'll be like well we can't we can't give you orders because you you put you, it's not it's not like talking back orders you're you're literally almost crashing into your teammate on the cooldown lap yeah, it's, it's, it's very it's, silly. It's mad. Um, I'm sure he'll probably regret it. And, yeah, he will. Um, they'll move on and we, this will be a, a no topic and it will be squashed by Saudi and they'll be best of friends and, I don't know, Sonoda will be riding on the back of Danny Rick or something into into the paddock. But uh, one thing that we did very briefly touch on was that he was fighting Lance Stroll and I feel like we need to put some respect on Lance Stroll's name after the lap one incident to then claw his way back in an Aston Martin that wasn't very good uh, all the way up to P10, uh, finishing just one place behind Fernando Alonso. Um, so yeah I think that Stroll had a great race again one of those that you just don't see anything of him and then he pops up and gets scores for him. <laughs> and yeah I, th- I think he, he he deserves a little shout out it was very much a race like we saw a lot of the time in 2022 where didn't qualify particularly great but you know it wasn't his fault at all that he got punted around at the start um, so dropped all the way back and then you're like oh Stroll's out of it and then He's got a point. That, that happened so many times, uh, I feel like, in 2022 when he was with Vettel uh, as his teammate. Uh, and, you know, he's done it Done it again. It was a good drive. Next question, Colky Doe. Does Haas have a chance of not finishing last in the Constructors after today's race? Kevin showed much better race pace than last year so far and defended against the RBs <sighs> super well. I think Haas will be pleasantly surprised with their outing this weekend Komatsu as we heard and as we've spoken about predicted that they would be last and they weren't Magnussen finished 12th held off uh, the both the RBs Hulkenberg was involved in that incident at the start finished 16th and I think the Haas looked like it was a little bit better on its tyre wear than perhaps previously and they still have somewhat of one lap pace, as, Hulk, as we saw with Hulkenberg getting through to Q3 yesterday. So I would say it's, it's a positive look for Haas uh, moving forward for this year. I will say that Haas usually are the best when they come out the blocks in the first round of the season <laughs> and then slowly get slower because they don't have any money or anything to actually upgrade a car. But it's not looking too bad. So, um, yeah, I might have to apologise to them after predicting them finishing 10th in the Constructors. I wasn't familiar with your game. Uh, yeah, it's it's an impressive performance. Yeah, Magnussen, P12, didn't fall off a, a cliff like they have done, managed to, to stay ahead of the two uh, RBs. And yeah, what might have been for, for Hulkenberg, maybe we would have got P11. But uh, again, I, think I mentioned this on stream, but not going to be a lot of points available uh this season if 
essentially we've got five top teams in the first race of the season there's not one retirement which is mad yeah really because is. that is that is when cars have teething issues and stuff and it's a you know bahrain i know they had overheating issues and stuff but they all made the checkered flag even logan Sargent steering wheel uh pooping itself and then just decided to reboot and come back on and uh carried on so even he didn't even retire from that um same with bottas with a slow pit stop everyone finished and that's going to make it extremely hard to score points um so it genuinely could be a case of a bit like last year really where a rogue wet race and a crazy result could could be the difference between seventh and tenth in the in the constructors it certainly could um and they are ahead i mean if, if you're told Haas at the beginning of the year you'll be ahead of alpine they probably thought okay all right we're cooking we Magnus might be getting P12 some points in the title. every single weekend uh but uh no not quite but they're definitely a, a decent light for for Haas so far next question morgs f1 will alpine score a point this season Without Bottas and Sargent incidents, they were 15 seconds behind at the end. I'm going to say they are going to score points. This must be the worst for them. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed for their sake, that this is the worst for them. Uh, you know, you think of McLaren, they had a similar um, really poor start uh, the last couple of years. So it is possible to figure out what's going wrong and fix it. And I'm, I'm sure Alpine will be able to find that. But as you said, Tommy, and as we've kind of been speaking about, this top five teams are pretty fast. I mean, Aston Martin, maybe you could argue a little bit off the top four uh, this weekend, but I think that was a surprise. I think Lando said after the race, that it was didn't really know why the Aston Martins were so far behind. Uh, so I'm sure Alpine will score a point, but it's going to be a difficult one. And this isn't an overnight fix. I can't see them turning up to Saudi and scoring points, for example. Uh, they've clearly got something fundamentally wrong with the car because it's slow in qualifying and it's slow in the race. There's there's no saving grace at the moment. Yeah, it, it's looking like it's going to get worse for Alpine before it, it gets better. Um, uh, a page called Racing News 365 have reported that two of the key figures in their um uh in alpine in terms of like developing the car and stuff have handed in their resignations and are playing out their notice period so uh the technical director and head of aerodynamics so if that is the case yeah they're they are they're in such a mess you know it's not just they were in a mess last year and it seems to be getting even worse and if they're losing key personnel as well they're only just gonna sort of like get even worse it it's, could be a horrible horrible long year for alpine i was gonna say as well could this be the beginning of the end of alpine's adventure in formula one full stop you know if they're not if they're not doing their brand any good and they're struggling and they're trying to push these alpine it's, road yeah, cars it's not a good and they're look, finishing is it? ninth or 10th could that open up a spot for Andretti up the inside? Uh, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> right now, Alpine, yeah, they're going to want to forget round one and probably the next few races at the very least. Okay, let's go to biggest winner then, driver or team. My biggest winner... Max Verstappen, I think. <laughs> <laughs> literally i think it has to be because he did win by a big margin he's come out the blocks with a brand new philosophy of red bull car it's still really quick they've probably got a much higher ceiling than other teams in terms of development windows and development opportunities uh, yeah it's it's really bad formula one's okay we'll turn up every week and we'll <laughs> dream of a different pecking order <laughs> but yes, I think it has to be Max Verstappen biggest winner this week. Uh, it's hard to say against Verstappen, isn't it? Um, you mentioned Stroll earlier as a bit of an unsung hero. I'll also shout out Zhe Guan Yu, finished 11th, um, which is very impressive. Uh, but maybe I'll say Sainz just because uh, he doesn't have a drive uh, next year and I think this, this performance will... Uh, if he keeps playing in performances like this, um, 
yeah, it's going to be very fascinating to see how the driver market pans out. Biggest loser. Who lost the most at the 2024 Bahrain Grand Prix? Mine's going to be a team (laughs) and it's going to be Alpine. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Alpine. uh, I think uh, close uh, runners-up are both Bottas and Sargent. Bottas having, he loves a long pit stop, that Valtteri. 52-second pit stop for him. Uh, And then Logan Sargent. And poor Logan, actually. Yeah, like... You know, I'm sure everyone's expecting me to do a joke about how he's still ended up P20 and he's P20 in the title at the moment. But he was he was running well. Um, Williams maybe not as good as we thought they might be, um, but he was he was there or thereabouts with with Albon. So it's a big shame that that happened to him. They both had uh, steering wheel issues, I think, mm, uh, which yeah. is a bit worrying because they were, of course, the the team that. Uh, for so long, we're running that steering wheel where they didn't have the the big fancy uh, like LED screen. No on. silly technology. They just had it yeah. built in the car with like gear and how fast they're going. Yeah, maybe a few other things. Um, but yeah, as soon as they've gone to something else, it's like nope, does not work, which is uh, very strange. But yeah, poor Logan, because um, as you say, he was doing he was doing all right. Right. Let's now reflect on our predictions that we made. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, all the way back on Tuesday, wasn't it? Because it was a, uh, a day earlier. And let's see how well we've done. Biggest good surprise. I went for Lewis Hamilton. Mm. That, the only thing surprising was how particularly difficult his weekend was, to be honest with you. Um, not much to really talk about. Had a bad qualifying Um, and then just got stuck in the pack. I think he said after the race that had he started a few places further ahead, he probably would have finished there. But um, that's the... the It's insane to me that it was only four seconds off as well, off Russell, after all that. After all the chaos, his seat breaking, I think he had some recharge issues or something like that as well. Um, But yeah, that's just Hamilton, isn't it? uh, He is decent in the race, but unfortunately not, uh, not a lot of points to show for it this time, so I can't even argue one eighth of a point. One inch of a point, a quarter of an inch of a point. <laughs> of of a point. Uh, biggest good surprise I went for Fernando Alonso, which is looking quite good after um, qualifying. Uh, he was up there because my thinking behind it was not that he was going to do heroics like he did last year, but he'd be in that mix. But actually, Aston Martin fell into the exact place that everyone thought they'd be which was behind the other four big teams. Yeah, fifth fastest. Ninth uh, and they, tenth, so. Alonso was getting mugged because he was trying to fight, but just kept just being overtaken. He was on a yeah. slightly different offset strategy, wasn't he? So we just saw him getting overtaken by um, everyone. Uh, but yeah, finishing ninth uh, in, in no man's land, really, uh, Aston Martin, uh, which mm. is a shame to see. Biggest flop. Okay, let me sit up for this one. I went for Esteban Ocon and... I feel as though I deserve a point here um, because Alpine was shocking. Both drivers deserve floppy points, to be honest with you. Um, Gasly finished nine tenths behind his teammate. And <laughs> I think anything associated with Alpine at the moment deserves a flop point. So, uh, come yeah, on. you can, yeah, you can have it. There was a point, there, there was a moment where Ocon was like 30 seconds clear of yeah. Gasly. And I was going, <laughs> you're not going to get this somehow. But and then I was like, oh my 17. God, no, Gasly's on softs. Oh, he's catching him at four seconds a lap. Come on, Gasly. So, the uh, the yeah. funniest thing about that whole situation is you you could have said like, if Gasly would have taken finishing like 12th or even maybe 10th and getting a point and not being Ocon, you know that he would have taken finishing 17th and just beating Ocon over <laughs> a point. You know he'd have been so determined on that soft oh, run, yeah. putting in qualifying lap after qualifying <laughs> lap, seeing the delta to Ocon going down, going, I have to beat him. You so just true. know that that, that is the case. Um, so I went for biggest flop McLaren. Sadly, Well, I say sadly not. I'm glad I was wrong. Um yeah, but, they weren't floppy, but they weren't also no. Good surprising, I said, were they? Yeah, I think I, I, I personally was trying to trying to claim that they would be like the worst of the best. So I think if they were behind Aston Martin, that's what I was kind of going it. for here. Yeah. But but they they did pretty good, and I think Lando said that this isn't a track that that really suits them or ever ever has. So they'll take a six and eighth. 
They will. And also he kind of gave a little bit of hope saying that he doesn't think, he thinks that Bahrain and Red Bull is pretty much a perfect track for them and that yeah. this should be the biggest gap of the season. Uh, I'm praying that Lando is right. And uh, we'll have to <laughs> wait and see. But I guess it does make sense, right? It's an abrasive track. Red Bull are really good on their tyres and it just makes oh, we sense. We saw that, that with their strategy as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, going soft, hard, soft. I mean, it's just a joke at this point, isn't it, really? Uh, pole position. I went for Charles Leclerc, which I think was brave. I think it deserves a half participation <laughs> point. <laughs> no. Like, well done. Like The first driver behind Verstappen deserves half a point. Thank you. He actually got Six the fastest time in qualifying as well, didn't he? Yeah, that's half a point. No, I think that makes it even Fastest worse. time in qualifying. I thought that's what it was. I thought that's what pole position is. I said <laughs> fastest time in qualifying goes to. Fastest on, well, Friday, technically. Yes. Exactly. Um, no I went for Verstappen and yeah, well he did it. You're very happy with the money. Took a risk. You did. You really did. Uh, let's go to our top three then, shall we? In third place, I went for Perez and he actually outperformed my prediction, which um, fair play to him. P3, I went for Alonso. No yeah, winner. Delusion. I don't think he's making your top three next week, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, Charles Leclerc, I went for P2, which is um, upsetting to say the least. Uh, but... Um, that did not happen. I think it could have happened without his brake issues, but it, it, it did not. P2, I went for Carlos Sainz, which is really annoying because I I backed him, but uh, didn't get this one right, so no point. And then finally, I went for a really risky strategy here. I went for Max Verstappen <laughs> as the winner, and uh, I'm going to clock in a point. Love that. And I did the same, no surprise. Well done, mate. Well done. So it's two all. Well two done. All going us. into one crazy prediction where I said Max will win the race by less than 15 seconds. And I'm pretty sure it was 15 seconds come halfway through the race. So I think after that, Max just chilled out. Um, but no points, unfortunately, for me there. He was literally watching the screen at one point, didn't he? he? Mentioned in the. Yeah, he was watching Perez overtake Russell, I think it was. And he even said in the cool down room, yeah, that was a good move. I saw that. It's like, for <laughs> God's sake. <laughs> Bro's watching the race. Yeah, madness. Uh, mechanical issue for the RB20 during the weekend. No? No. Bulletproof. Absolutely not. You, you tried to chef something, and mm. unfortunately you, you, you chefed up 20 vehicles finishing the race. I know. So. Well done, Tommy. Uh, now, three crazy predictions from you wonderful lot. Uh, first is M. Lawrence. Both Mercedes DNF. That did not happen. Uh, Jarrett Ujula. Double Q3 for stake. Nope, that did not happen. And SD Best 8 the Ferraris and Mercs were a lot closer to Red Bull than we think, and it's a three-way fight for the win. I remember reading that and being in dreamland going, <laughs> God, can you imagine? And we didn't get even another car fighting for the win. So, um, But hey, Saudi Arabia is up next, a completely different track. It's going to be fast. It's going to be ferocious. It's going to punish mistakes. And we're going to see a crazy one, Tommy, aren't we? Please, please be good. Um, it is it is a track that's delivered in in the past, uh, and it's a very different track to Bahrain. So you never know. I hope I hope whatever happens, there's something different thrown into into the mix. Please, fingers please. crossed. We don't have to wait very long. We're literally back once again next weekend. We'll be live on Twitch, Matt P1 Tommy for both qualifying and the race, and we'll have all the podcast content both on P1 and also Wheel Knowledge. Don't forget that YouTube channel as well. We're going to be putting some content up on there, and also do not forget P1 live show tickets if you want to get them. Uh, they are selling. So we'd love to see you. And that is it, Tommy. Final thoughts. Final thoughts are my God. It's over. Um, I've already said it but just please be good Saudi give us some cool. entertainment Tommy's brain is fried as is mine uh, <laughs> but we will see you next week for more delusion can't wait to see uh, honestly I'll be, I'll be refreshed come Monday we're ready to go again so uh, yeah we'll see you very soon lots of love everybody take care bye bye